Hello, my name is Michael Hicks and welcome to the Round Table. Today we have with us Greg Goodnight, who's mayor of Kokomo. He's been in that position for a little over 10 years, taking over right at the beginning of the Great Recession. For that, he worked as a union representative for United Steel Workers for about 10 plants. So I think he'll have a lot of interesting insights about uh, cities throughout the Midwest. And so welcome, Greg. Uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Very good. Well, the first question is, tell me why on earth you wanted to become mayor of Kokomo? <laughs> Well, um, it's the town I love, and um, I was, uh, as I was president of the Steelworkers Union, I worked at a, a stainless steel manufacturer for almost 20 years, and uh, twice elected president uh, of that local for uh, six years, and uh, three-year terms, and it, I simultaneously served on the city council. There was some overlap there. I served two terms on the city council. It may sound arrogant, but I think it's why people should run for public office. I looked at, uh, as I was served on the city council, I looked at uh, the position of mayor and I thought I could do the job and do it well and, and maybe do it better than anybody else that I saw stepping up to run. So it, it was, it was uh, my, my passion for the city and I felt like I could do the job. And so uh, with the blessing of my wife, we jumped in and, and we were successful in the 2007 election. Here in Indiana, we have elections in off years. So Fall of 2007, the economy looked great. We were at the <laughs> peak of the 2001 to 2007 expansion. The recession started December of 2007, what, three weeks after yep. you were elected and yep. a, a month before you took office. Tell me about the challenges of taking office at that time period. It was difficult because um, my, my political affiliation is, uh, is I'm a Democrat and, and we had had 12 years of Republican mayor. So there was, a, uh, and, and uh, although we're, we still remain friends, my predecessor had was defeated in the Republican primary. So politics at the time were uh, very, very volatile. Um, I didn't come into a friendly environment uh, with a lot of the uh, uh, municipal employees. Um, so we had that challenge. Uh, and then we came in knowing that uh, uh, we, the finances, having been on the council, were on shaky ground. I did an immediate audit and we brought in an outside firm and they said basically uh, everything's pointing to a national, possibly uh, global recession and Kokomo's not prepared. We were deficit spending, doing some, had no uh, ample cash reserves. So uh, it was, you know, we kind of came in uh, with a lot of problems in front of us and, and within a few months, uh, less than a year for sure, we were uh, in, you know, had not only double digit unemployment, but we were, I think it peaked at about 22, 23% at one time. Right, so Kokomo being, I think, 50% manufacturing income. Yeah really got clobbered in the Great Recession. So so you took office in January 2008. By 2009, there were no cars being manufactured in the United States. So an 18 month period, half the commerce in your county and city shut down. Yeah, our largest employer uh, still today is FCA, Fiat Chrysler, uh, but this was before Fiat had uh, taken over the, the Chrysler uh, facility. Uh, we also had uh, Delphi Safety and Electronics as our second largest employer during the re, uh, reconstruction of the, or the, uh, the uh, auto industry. The, uh, after they reconfigured it, they split the General Motors plant and the Delphi plant. When they were together, that was our second largest employer. So we, uh, they actually shut down the, the four Chrysler uh, plants in Kokomo. They were on shutdown and, and had went dark for, I think if I remember, four, maybe five weeks while they were trying to find a suitable uh, purchaser of the plants. So there were just a lot of challenges. Uh, we also obviously trying to still, uh, with, with not enough uh, you know, money for payroll and things, we were really trying to uh, just, uh, I mean, we were kind of operating on a week to week ma decision making, uh, trying to put out fires, uh, as you might say, uh, uh, for that first year. Well, and, and our viewers outside Indiana won't know it, but at right about the same time, the General Assembly passed some property tax caps. Yes. And those were phased in from 2008 to, passed in 2008 to 2010, which essentially would have constrained a lot of the tax revenue that you were getting from these larger, larger plants. It put a bigger squeeze on cities and towns because uh, the way they're structured, you, know, you have that extra layer of government. So the unincorporated areas don't quite feel the property tax caps as much as uh, areas that, that cities uh, have because you, it it's really doesn't matter. It's the same cap whether it's distributed amongst four units of government or seven units of government. So um, yeah, we had that additional 
uh, concern. And we really had to just, uh, we took the approach, and, and I have to always give kudos to uh, our city council. They, they recognized the situation. They knew this wasn't going to be uh, fun times, and they, they, along with us and, and other members of our administration, decided we're going to do what's right for the city. And, and we took that, we're gonna take the long approach, and if the politics don't work out, so be it. Uh, if the is you know is the goal to get reelected or is the goal t uh, to make our city better? We took the we're going to make the city better approach. So we had to make some tough decisions. We did uh, decisions. We made some uh, wage freezes. We had some uh, changes in how we operated city government. We made sure we um, we had to get some of these things right. Uh, we no longer provided free services to the unincorporated areas. We reevaluated contracts with other units of government. We found we were, you know, things like dispatch services, uh, you know, we had operated our own, but yet we were uh, taxpayers in Kokomo paid into the county system, so we were paying twice for the same service. So we really had to go through a lot of battles to make sure that we, you know, we paid, you know, we were getting a fair share of what, you know, those limited tax dollars that we were getting our fair share and um, it was being spent on, on, on the people that were paying the taxes. Walk me through, if you could, how you explain to public employees, many of whom I think expect that this is a very safe, permanent <laughs> job, what, what, the, what the, the challenges of office and balancing budgets means, particularly in a recession. Well, I tried my best to explain that, um, you know, especially as, you know, as a union president uh, in, in the early part of this, this century, uh, we, I had to make tough decisions too for our members. You know, we had to reevaluate our health care plans, look at our pension uh, plans, and, and were they, uh, you know, were they uh, going to be viable in the future? And, and we had to, you know, so I had to work with companies to make, you know, my number one responsibility as a union president uh, is not, uh, I always took it as not getting them raises, not getting them better health care, not getting them better vacation packages. My long-term and number one goal was to make sure that they had long-term uh, job stability. That was my that was the, the best thing I could do for our members, and that's what I wanted to do for the city, that uh, let's, let's take our medicine now, let's uh, you know, you know, do the things we have to do to get better, and we want to, you know, and hopefully in four, five, ten years, we will have made the decisions that, that make sure that you know, that long-term stability. And that's what I tried to express when I when I would speak at Rotary meetings, Kiwanis meetings, uh, public meetings, things like that. That's interesting. So if I were to look back to my first exposure with Kokomo a decade or so ago, uh, driving around. But it was a, a, a nice town, but it, I think you've described it as a typical sort of Rust Belt town. You're an hour north of Indianapolis, yeah. just right outside of the, the commuting zone for, yeah. for many households. 50% um, manufacturing employment, um, but walk me through, if you could, how you think that has changed where we are now in, in the fall of 2000, or the, the winter of 2018. What's happened over that? When we really started diving into the numbers and um, in some of these things, uh, you know, when you look at strategic plans, things like that, the biggest challenge we faced economically uh, is, I always tell people, we had jobs. We had 9,000 people that commuted in to Howard County our, uh, uh, every week and, t and had good jobs, but they chose to live other places. And so that's what, that was our biggest challenge. And I always uh, said that if, you know, I, I, I need the people there and, and, and the return on investment for getting jobs to our community, but not getting the people to live there and not only financially invest in our community, we needed the people there to, to coach uh, you know, our youth baseball programs. We need them to be uh, volunteers with the Girl Scouts, to be United Way supporters, to be active in community days, as well as support the local businesses and things. So that's the kind, we, we took a different approach. What can we do? Uh, these are the things that our local government can control because I can't really control if the auto industry globally collapses or is successful, I can't really control what's you know, the decisions made in a corporate boardroom uh, on the East Coast or on the West Coast. And so what can we do and, and what can we manage here? And really it was just to kind of clean up the older areas of town that maybe had not had a, uh, much TLC in the, la <laughs> in the last few years and, and uh, you know, do those things that make our parks nice uh, and hopefully keep the people that uh, were considering leaving Kokomo, helping, you know, helping them decide uh, to decide to stay there. And then maybe the ones that had left, maybe, uh, and now they're getting to the age where they want to raise families, maybe they'll come back as well. And so that was the approach we took. What, what can we control and how can we uh, make that a successful plan for the future? 
That's interesting because, you know, as an economist, I look at the data on your city. And so in, in comparison to other places in the Midwest, population decline, which was expected and ubiquitous, is sort of reversed. You're growing again. It's a yeah. huge uh, in, change to see that growth. And uh, gross domestic product, the value of the size of your economy is, is growing faster, much faster than other places there at a time when you would have expected it to have uh, really tanked in consequence of, of all this. What and many other cities have. And uh, I think part of that, and it well, as well as our assessed values of our local property from, from the uh, residential, the commercial, the industrial, the values have went up, which has helped us with things like those uh, property tax caps. A lot of it too is, as I said, we have right-sized city government. When I came in, we had 521 full-time employees for a city of, uh, at that time, about 46,000 people. Uh, we annexed a lot of the unincorporated areas, which was very difficult. There, were, there was public outcry, and, 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 uh, you know, it, which really is a, uh, a, a, because of the change. <laughs> people, people wanted to live on the fringes of the city or right next to the city, but they didn't want to be a part of the city, although they were receiving city services. So uh, now we're a city of about 58,000 people. We annexed about a little over 11,000 of the unincorporated areas, which were uh, kind of a Swiss cheese uh, layout of the city, and we defined what, what we believe to be the real city boundaries. And we're running the city uh, right now with about 360 full-time employees. So that is a uh, well over 25% decrease in the number of city employees, and, uh, and that's been across the board from, from police, fire, uh, trash services to every department has has felt some sort of pain, and, and a lot of it is we've aut uh, you know used automation where we could in some of our billing services, okay. and uh, we've changed some of the employee benefits where they had a very generous uh, 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 employee benefits package, a lot of time off uh, for holidays, personal days, some of those things, and we've tried to make the um, the public uh, the public's uh, uh, employees package mirror more what the private sector has in Kokomo. It used to be we had a formula for every uh, four jobs that we needed to be uh, tasks we needed to take place in Kokomo. We had five plus employees and so that formula really wasn't going to work in the long run. So, so now we've been able to take our limited resources with tax caps and things and shift it from from what I called self economic development to those some of those employees, and now we put it into the to investing in our community through nicer roads, nicer parks, nicer public spaces, and things. So, well, so if you can, could you describe a little bit of the physical layout of Kokomo? Where's the blight? Where are the nicer neighborhoods? Where are the stable older neighborhoods? Yeah. And 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 how do you think that that plays together? And where do you sort of focus your attention as mayor? You know, there are some places that you could call their big. T they're a big town. I consider Kokomo a small city, mm -hmm. uh, in that we have a little bit of everything. We have an Indiana University campus. We have an uh, Ivy Tech regional campus. Purdue University has a presence in Kokomo. We have large employees. We have small employers, and um, we really have a wide range of, of demographics. We have people that are struggling, maybe in, in, for one reason or another, and we have some people that have a, a, quite a bit of wealth that, that, that live in the city of Kokomo. Uh, the, the city was formed in the center part. Uh, just a, it, we were one of the last counties to be incorporated. It was a Miami in, Indian Village, so we were one of the last counties to be incorporated. Uh, and then it grew. Uh, the older part of the city grew to the north, and then in, in the in the in the uh, 1950s or so, that's when the city started moving to the south, closer migrating towards Indianapolis. And so I have neighborhoods, new subdivisions. Uh, last two years have been uh, you know have been the best years for new housing permits in Kokomo uh, in the last decade. And a lot of those are on the south side and in the newer neighborhoods. But I have some areas that just really. I don't want to say they were neglected because I don't want to criticize my predecessors, but I don't think they were a priority uh, for some of them. And so we have really focused on um, flipping what are the worst areas. That's part of our, you know, we focused on redevelopment, uh, trying to uh, fill in those missing teeth, those holes inside the city. So we've taken the most challenging neighborhoods and um, I tell people when we have an opportunity for uh, a nice investment, we build a, a downtown baseball stadium, we build a brand new YMCA, $16 million YMCA, $10 million baseball stadium. Uh, we have a $32 million luxury apartments being built. Uh, they actually they'll open February 1st with the first units uh, in downtown Kokomo. But when we have an opportunity for that big investment, how do we leverage it to get the, the, the most from it? And so 
Uh, we could have built that baseball stadium in an, in an area that's, that's, you know, in a brown field, in a cornfield out on the fringes of the city, but I would still have that blighted piece in the center of the city. So we took the baseball stadium and we eliminated the blight and put the new stadium there, and we feel like we, that was the best return we could get on that investment. So today, when you compare yourself to other Midwestern cities, a Muncie, a Detroit, a, a Akron, or a Toledo, um, what percentage of your homes do you think are really no longer habitable or are really going to have to be given way to blight? We have some that, that have uh, sat empty for a couple of years, but we don't have, uh, they're really sprinkled out in certain neighborhoods, but we don't have uh, where we have multiple blocks of blight and, uh, and uh, unusual, unusable pro uh, homes and things like that. So we. We started a program last fall. Uh, it's our urban infilling program. We've took, taken some of our economic development dollars and uh, we, the council appropriated $1.6 million. And we're going to build new homes in the middle parts of the city and some of those empty lots. Um, and we have two or three neighborhoods that we're targeting. The first two are under construction now. Uh, we're working in what's considered the Silk Stocking neighborhood. This was a neighborhood that was developed about 100 years ago. These were, uh, used to be kind of the wealthier part of the city at one time. Um, I actually used to own a house there when uh, years ago, but it's it, and it, it's it's really a nice neighborhood. It has some spots that need fix, and so the whole idea is to stable stabilize neighborhoods like that. And we'll we'll probably lose a little bit of money in this program. We're probably going to build homes. Uh, I'm going to say 160, 170 thousand dollar homes. We may lose 15 to 20 thousand dollars on those homes, but then we'll reinvest once we sell them, and we'll put them back in the program. We hope to build about 70 to 80 homes in, in the older parts of the community. Um, and, and like I say, we're focusing maybe 10 or 12 in this neighborhood, 10 or 12 in this neighborhood to stabilize. And they're, they're, they're nice homes, they, they fit the neighborhood, they, they fit the, the style. You know, these are front porch, two car garage in the back, all those. Um, and, and hopefully it will encourage the people that are still there to reinvest in their homes. And their property values will go up and it will stabilize it long term. So we're really working, um, you know, uh, like I say, th we've got some neighborhoods I identified. We have our first two under construction and we'll see how they sell here in about a month. Well, it sounds interesting. Good time of year to be selling. Before we go on, I really want to dig into some of the particular improvements that you've made. Your economy is shifting. You've mentioned a couple of large plants that probably 40 years ago had 4,000 men and women walking in out the front door. Yeah. They're down to five, six hundred now with, right. uh, through a combination of productivity, automation, that sort of thing. What, what type of economic changes do you think are really affecting your county or going to populate your county your, and your city with new workers? Well, most people, if you read what, what the uh, economists say, and these are, um, and, and there's, this comes from multiple sources, you know, the economy's driven, and I think the number varies, but it's somewhere around 70, 75% of the economy is driven from where people live. So the things we have that uh, we need to take advantage of, as I believe, our assets are, uh, the first one is our proximity to Indianapolis and the growth that has happened on the north side of Indianapolis and Hamilton County. So you have that uh, part of Ham Hamilton County that has, has grown uh, faster than any other part of the state. It's the incomes, you know, you look at all the demographics and it says the right things, uh, you know, uh, of what you should be doing. We're 30 minutes from that, 35 minutes from that growth. We're 45 minutes uh, or so from the very north side of Indianapolis, an hour and 10 minutes away from uh, Indianapolis International Airport. That's, that's one of our best assets. The other is we have an IU campus that's growing at the f uh, fastest rate of all the IU campuses, including the home campus in Bloomington, Indiana. So anything we can do to encourage that growth, we've worked with them on adding sports. Uh, now they have, over the last four or five years, they've now have a sports program where they have college basketball, both women's and men's, uh, women's volleyball, women's golf, uh, uh, women's tennis, uh, men's baseball, it starts this spring, so they'll be playing in our downtown stadium, so we can, we can help the campus grow. And then we, we're in a situation for a city our size that's different than a lot of others. We have two uh, large hospitals uh, with different affiliation, one with St. Vincent, one with Community Hospital, but they're tied to bigger hospital networks. And so we really need to make sure that in our small part of the state, we're the regional hub for education, for uh, goods and services, the healthcare uh, related, 
uh, but also for shopping and, and just those different unique experiences. With that, we also need to tie into our proximity to Indianapolis uh, and make sure that we're part of that growing Indianapolis economy. As, they, as most experts say, these uh, bigger regions are, are where the growth is going to happen and not necessarily in those smaller rural areas, and we need to make sure we're part of that. So tell me about downtown. What have you done? You've described some of the housing, some of the reinvestment, the roadway work. What about downtown itself? What have you done there? Well, downtowns are important, and it's hard to get people you know, to, to, to understand that that is what makes most cities unique. And you can, my, my joke is, if you watch a, uh, uh, a, a professional sports game and uh, Monday night football, they show the skyline of the cities, and that's what makes uh, San Francisco uh, more unique uh, than Seattle or, or uh, where Miami or whatever cities are playing. And it's the same for city, mid-sized cities and small cities. So that's, it's an important part, and it's the community space. It's, it's more, it's usually has more public investment from whether it be a county courthouse or a city hall or your, your, your main parks. Um, ours, uh, we have, it, it's the, the right street grid, uh, we, you know, it, it's set up the right way, but again, we had uh, maybe not taken very good care of it for, and maybe let it go. Uh, for a while. So we, we did some major changes in my second year. We went to all two-way streets. We eliminated the one-way streets. We took out every traffic light in downtown Kokomo, put in four-way stops. We invested in curb enhancements that, that made it easier for people to get across, made it more pedestrian friendly. Um, we planted flower baskets, put in decorative street lamps. Uh, and took out all the parking meters because we felt like it had discouraged people from visiting if they didn't have the proper coins and things like that. So we made it just uh, uh, two hour parking and we have a person that goes and chalks tires and, and, and does that as opposed to the kind of these old meters that were in the, uh, needed replaced. And, and that was the first step. And then we did a small facade grant, a match uh, of up to $5,000. Uh, we would match local businesses. If they, you know, they put in 5, 000, up to 5,000, we would match it. And we had many businesses that took advantage of that. Some of them put in as much as uh, $50,000 of their money, and we put in the, up to 5,000. And that fact, that program was so successful, we discontinued it about three or four years ago. We don't have to incentivize any longer. So we did that, and then when we had some opportunity for, uh, for multi-unit housing, uh, we looked at getting people down there as well. So we found some areas that were blighted or, or underutilized and worked with different developers to uh, invest there and put, put people back uh, down there. So we have some new apartments uh, that have went up over the last four or five years. We had uh, YMCA that for years had talked about building a new YMCA. They had just, they thought about taking it and moving it to the south side. We worked with them, found them uh, some space to put it, and now we have, like I say, a $16 million urban YMCA. I think it's the most beautiful YMCA in the state of Indiana, right downtown. Uh, we uh, helped them by building a city parking garage. It, it cost taxpayers about six and a half million dollars, and we were able to pay off that bond before the parking garage was completed. Uh, so in that year and a half it took to build that, we were able to uh, kind of uh, get our cash uh, reserve put together and pay that off. So uh, and on, when we built that garage, we also put in some luxury apartments above it. Uh, they've been open for two and a half years. They're 100% occupied. Uh, and the developer told me this about six months ago that um, the, uh, every tenant that lived there had moved from, none of them had moved from within Howard County. They were all people that had moved from outside Howard County. So we thought that kind of paid off as well. So that's interesting as we wrap up. I want to hear I've heard great stories about the last decade. I think that's very illustrative of the sort of urban focused growth in a smaller Midwestern town. What are your contemporary challenges? Where do you see you going with the city over the next decade? One of the things I think is important, I tell people, when, we, when you have that opportunity for, for new things, YMCA's baseball stadium, all those things, we, you, you need to cluster them together, and that's an important part, and not have them sprinkled throughout. And then Indianapolis has done a good job with Lucas Oil Stadium uh, next to Victory Field, uh, White River State Park, and try to keep those assets together, and that gets the better restaurants and the better housing options. With that, I always say Kokomo's biggest, uh, having lived there my entire life, and I said this in a State of the City speech seven or eight years ago, and I worry about this, Kokomo always makes it through the tough challenges. We, we, we are known for that. From plant closings, we had a major steel mill close down uh, in the mid-1980s. We've had the ups and downs of the auto industry. We've had uh, tornadoes come through that were devastating uh, and, and you know, disrupted the city for, for months as we tried to rebuild. But we have always made it through the difficult times. 
what keeps me awake at night is can we handle success? <laughs> can we, um, you know, do we, do, we, do we become complacent where good enough is just becomes good enough? Or do we um, take advantage of the good times and make the right strategic investments so that we have long-term security? That's awfully interesting. So just last question, tell me about your alleys. We've really cleaned up our alleys and we take pride in those urban downtown alleys and make them uh, pedestrian spaces and, and something that people can be proud of. So we have different lighting, we have public art in our alleys, um, we have uh, beautiful flower uh, and, and uh, greenery uh, in our alleys and um, it's something, it's a sense of pride in our community. So you take a, what most folks would view as a nuisance and turn it into a benefit, that's, right? That's the whole idea. Oh, that's great. Well, I, I appreciate you so much coming. I think these insights will be a great deal of interest to those who are viewing the round table. Um, hopefully, I'm going to ask you to come back in a couple of years and tell me how the success has worked out and, for and, you. And I welcome you and all your viewers. To, you're welcome to come to Kokomo, and I'd love to show you around. What's the best time of year to visit? Um, I say in the uh, late spring. Uh, I, we we have went on a tree planting frenzy over the last three or four years, and you need to be there when the when the trees are in bloom and, and the leaves are on the trees. Early May then. Early May's good. Thank you so My much. My pleasure. Thank you. Great. Good night, Mayor of Kokomo.